Can everyone hear me okay? Okay, so like Emily said, my name is Kirby Shedden. I'm a faculty member in the Department of Statistics. That's my main uh, role at the university. I've been at the University of Michigan for about 13 years, and I've been using R for about that long. R has existed for about that long. And um, recently, um, this year, I also took a, an additional position at the university as the director for the Center for Statistical Consultation and Research, which supports R and gives R workshops and um, provides uh, uh, R based uh, consulting for statistical projects. I'm going to show you about that. Uh, let me first introduce the other uh, people I have with me here today who are actually going to be doing most of the talking. So these are five students from the undergraduate program of statistics at the University of Michigan, where we use R in a lot of our classes, so that makes a lot of sense to have them come and do the talking rather than me. I think four of them are here now, and maybe we'll get the fifth at some point. Bernice is not here, but Yu Chen will be talking in a few minutes. Uh, Sang Wan uh, in. Alex just walked in, thankfully. And uh, Chong Zhang. Hello. Awesome. There you go. That way you can definitely hear the screen. Okay. So this is CSCAR, the place I talked about a minute ago. So if you're not familiar with CSCAR, CSCAR is right across the street over in the Rackham building. It's been around for about 20 years. And it's the University of Michigan's primary statistical consulting operation. We support all sorts of empirical research and data analysis in a wide variety of software packages. Historically, we did a lot of stuff with SAS and SPSS, but recently we're getting a lot more people coming in with questions involving R and Python and big data sets. So don't just think of us as your sort of grandmother's statistical consulting group. We do mixed models, we do log odds ratio tests and logistic regression and all that stuff. But we do data mining, we do visualization and all kinds of modern stuff too. Um, the way we work is we have uh, consulting appointments. You can call that number there and sign up for an hour-long appointment and meet with one of our consultants for, for an hour. If you have a slightly more basic question or just don't want to wait for a consulting appointment, you can just show up over in the Rackham building and we have um, graduate students, PhD students in statistics and biostatistics who are at our front desk and can meet with you on the spot. And uh, they're actually quite good and can address a lot of needs um, very quickly. You feel free to send a question to one of our email support addresses. We have about eight email support addresses, but I'm just listing two of them here. Statistics.help is the general statistics question line for more methodological questions or questions about study design and interpretation. And then our stat.help, relevant here is our our, um, our, help, our email address for questions involving um, the R programming language and data analysis uh, using R. We have a bunch of other uh, aliases for uh, other packages that I don't listen to. And then we give workshops. Um, we have a bunch of workshops, but two of them I thought I would highlight here would be our statistics review workshop um, and then the uh, uh, statistical analysis with our workshop. So these are um, three hour or six hour, depending on the particular workshop, uh, long uh, workshops. And they, they do have a tuition associated with them. You can check our website uh, for that. But they're very well put together. They get very good reviews. If you have the time and resources to participate in that, people always say that they get a lot out of it. Um, finally, I'll just mention in terms of eligibility, we're very widely open to the, to the university community. Anyone who's a faculty member, a staff member, basically anyone who's doing research at the university, graduate students, I didn't mention it here, but some undergraduate students are also eligible to use our services. Basically, as long as you're doing research, we're here to work with you on that. So that's CSCAR. Give us a chance if you haven't used this yet. And now a bit about R. So R is the topic of our discussion today. I wonder if there's a way to make this slightly smaller than each slide is only about 80% on the screen. So um, many of you might know that R is um, probably, well, without question, the dominant statistical uh, language and analysis framework used by research statisticians and more advanced statistical methodologists, plus a lot of data mining folks and people in all kinds of fields now, epidemiology and geostatistics use R too. R has been around, I guess the first lines of code of R were written in 1993, that's why what I've been told, and uh, it became available for uh, sort of leading edge type people in 1997 and was um, announced as sort of a mature, ready for production use environment in around the year 2000. And the two folks who uh, are primarily responsible for getting off the ground are Ross Ihaka, a statistician who works out of New Zealand, and Robert Gentleman, who's um, now at Genentech as the director of the bioinformatics group. And um, they would be the first to say that R is uh, 
standing on the shoulders of a much earlier innovation, which is the S language and framework for statistical computing that was developed by John Chambers um, much earlier at Bell Labs. Um, S, I think, is, is at least 1976, if not earlier, uh, was around. And it, throughout the 70s and the 80s, back when people didn't even really think about computing as being connected to statistics, except for a small subset of us, most of us were proving theorems back then. Um, S was really the, really the first real statistical language that could be used in a more sort of exploratory way. It wasn't like a canned thing like, at, like SAS, where you just kind of can only do one or two things and do them sort of over and over again in a fixed way. So S was developed, and then um, S was getting a little bit creaky, and there were some kind of odd um, legal issues around who owned the technology behind S because it was developed in Bell Labs. Bell Labs eventually sold the in intellectual property to S, uh, for us to a, a company called Insight out in Seattle, and they've struggled over the years, but it sort of managed to keep it alive as a commercial product called S Plus. But there's about 100 times more people using R, which is the re-implementation of S, which is fully fully open source, than are using the uh, commercial language S Plus. So you'll see a lot more R in the next few minutes, but R is an interactive language, so you sit down, you open the prompt, and you start typing. Um, you can type in commands, the results spit back right out to you in the screen. You can also use it as a more traditional computing language in the sense that you write a script and then write a script, say, in an editor or an integrated development environment and then save it and source it into the interpreter. And I will close my part of the discussion with um, just some highlights of resources that are out there. R is actually a very social uh, language in the sense that there are big communities of people using it. There's lots of interaction on the web between people who are using R for different purposes or using R for the same purposes. There's a huge bioinformatics community using R, but also geostatistics and epidemiology and social science statistics and all kinds of areas. So there's a lot of great stuff on the web where people get together and talk about R. Um, the main R site, easy to find. Um, the R blogger site is, is an amazing thing. It's about 300 bloggers who kind of have run a meta blog. And there's all kinds of really high quality material there. And then um, the refereed R journal is Sort of different, it's more sort of formalized, like a journal, but there's lots of great stuff in the referee R journal. And then I wanted to point out two things um, that where R has kind of poked through to this sort of popular culture in, in a couple of different ways. About two or three years ago, there was an article in the New York Times that was widely cited about R and how influential it had become and research of all different sorts of fields. So you can dig that out, just Google R New York Times article, and that will come right up. And I also wanted to mention something that's actually um, going to be on TV tomorrow night. Uh, you may be surprised to hear me mentioning this, but 60 Minutes tomorrow night, the opening um, segment of their, of their show will be about a very controversial and sort of unfortunate event which happened um, in the medical research world, which is actually where I do most of my work. About five years ago, some researchers at Duke developed a prognostic signature for lung cancer, which is something that many people have been trying to do for many years. It worked amazingly well. So in other words, you, you run some lab tests on people with lung cancer, you feed the data through an algorithm, and what you get out is a number which tells you basically whether that person is likely to have a very aggressive, rapidly, rapidly progressing disease or a more indolent, slowly progressing disease. Um, a lot of people saw it. that paper when it first came out. We're very suspicious of the results. Um, this happens a lot in this field, but in this one in particular was, was even more unrealistic looking than some of the other things we see. And some statisticians down at MD Anderson using R, and that's why, that's why I mentioned it here, although I'm sure they won't mention R in the 60 Minutes piece. But using R did an amazing piece of forensic biostatistics and got the raw data back and did the best job they could reconstructing the analysis that these people at Duke had done. And the analysis wasn't very well described at all in their papers. And they uncovered a series of, of blatant mistakes and, and um, basically fraudulent um, actions on, on, on the part of these researchers research that do um, both dumb things and things that were done to deliberately inflate the apparent uh, prognostic value of the signature. It's a really interesting story about research and the pressure that researchers are under, but in the background of it, there's, there's, uh, there's R there as the tool that I know that these people down at uh, MD Anderson in Texas were using when they uncovered this whole story. So at that, I'm going to turn the um, podium over to Alex, right? Are you going to go first? Oh, okay. Chong is going to go first. Also. We're going to go together. And they're going to be talking about um, using R to do descriptive statistics and um, maybe I should let someone else do this. I have no idea. They're going to talk about using R to do descriptive statistics 
And, um, and then we'll move on to some more advanced techniques later in the hour. Uh, hi. Uh, now we will talk something about our descriptive statistics. Uh, descriptive stats uh, quantitatively describe the main features of a collection of data. Uh, let's look at this cartoon. Uh, the first step uh, says my salary is 45,000 is a middle salary in my company. So uh, 45,000 is a median, so it's, it's a concept uh, uh, in the uh, central tendency. Uh, the manager asks how do salaries vary across the company, so it's, uh, it's a concept in disparate. Uh, the last uh, is some uh, concept uh, in the in their distribution. So this cartoon shows three different aspects in their, uh, in their descriptive stats. Uh, well, this is some basic function for their descriptive uh, stats in R. Uh, look at this mean, uh, this, show, uh, this will compute their tree mean. And uh, this A should be the percent you want to train or you want to remove. Um, so, one big thing with R is that if you're working with a large data set, you can easily figure out what the dimensions are of that data set. So, um, at the top here, we just have a vector data set. So, you know, just one row and, you know, many columns and, you know, let's say it's, it's true length. There's an easy length function that can figure out the length of your data set. And then also, when you're dealing with matrices, um, <coughs> It's really easy, it is you know, a good starting point because you, know, you need to identify your sample sizes and so forth when you're working with large sets of data. So you can use the n row function for the, to figure out the number of rows, the n columns, or the dimensions um, will spit out both. Um, so when you, to, you know, at the starting point to figure out you know, what is the size of the data that you're working with. Um, then R has a pretty cool feature. Um, it's, it's a vectorized language, so Basically, no matter the size of the data, it's very easy to manipulate and do descriptive statistics on like large columns and sets of your data at one time. So there's this really great function, you know, Chong showed you like you know, the mean, standard deviation functions. Well, if you have, you know, a, let's say a larger data set than this, like, you know, it could go, you know, thousands of columns, but you want to figure out what the means are of all the columns or rows per se. Well, so first, I guess the rows, let's say the rows play some significance. Um, you can use the apply function, and so if your whole matrix is titled X, you can put in the X. The margin, the one, stands for the columns, and then you put your function mean. So that will calculate the mean across all of the rows and give you one vector that just contains all the means. So no matter what size data set you're working with, you're able to do that. And the function isn't limited to you know the descriptive statistics that we showed before. Even if you write your own function, you're able to apply that to entire rows of data. And same thing for the columns. Let's say you wanted to, these are you know, company salaries or so forth, you wanted to calculate the means for each company, you can use the apply function there as well to, um, to figure out what the mean salary is for all this company. And then store them in their own vector that you, know, you can manipulate or compare and make graphs for and so on and so forth. Um, so box plot is uh, simple but very useful tools for the, uh, for the stats. Uh, the bottom of the box should be the uh, mean the uh, minimum, a uh, minimum, and then the first quarter, and the middle is median, and then the third, uh, third quarter, and the maximum. Uh, these dots uh, mean the outlier. Uh, we know sometimes uh, outlier may uh, may influence our uh, result, so we must keep them out. We, in this case, we define the outlier by using the 1.5 times uh, IQR. Well, um, uh, box plot is very, uh, it's good for the small data size, not the very large data size. It's easy to comp uh, compare the uh, compare the groups side by side. Uh, in this case, look at we can see the green uh green uh, the dispersion of the green group is much larger than the others. Now um, minimum first quarter uh median mean third quarter uh maximum um we can use this function to show this big six. Um, another thing that's, uh, I think, very useful with R is that it really tries to understand the types of data that you're working with. And a lot of the packages, like, 
really contain like code that will figure out for you whether you're working with categorical, quantitative, and like I think in the most part, as far as most languages that I've used, it really works with you and the types of data that you're working with. So this is an example of that same summary function that Chong showed, but you know obviously for a categorical uh, piece of data like gender, um, we don't want you know the maximum minimum so on, and you know, it'll summarize it in a more categorical form. And this goes for all sorts of functions that you use in a language. It'll really work with you to understand what you're inputting into it, and usually give you the result that you're looking for. So a big part of descriptive statistics is visualization. And I think R is one of the languages that like, is most known for the, the way that it can visualize data. The like, graphical capabilities of the program are really excellent. And so, um, you know, similar to the box plots that Chong showed, there's advantages and disadvantages to using a box plot or a histogram. You know, Chong mentioned that um, for box plots, if you have small data sets, that's, that's really useful to look at the box plots. But, you know, when you have a larger data set where you're more interested in the distribution of the data, um, the histogram function is really great in R. And you can see kind of like down at the bottom that BDI um, histogram is kind of like a little chunkier. You know, it could be a smaller data set that's go going for that, and then maybe a box plot would be a better visualization to do. But you know, for other ones, you can kind of see skewness in the uh, distributions, or if it's normal, if that's you know important to know what type of distribution it is. Um, the histogram is a really good way to see you know where does your data, how does it actually vary, you know, amongst um, in relation to one another. Um, then correlation, you know, something that anybody who's doing data analysis is very interested in. Um, correlation is very easy to do with R as well. This is a data set, you know, between weight of a car and the miles per gallon. And so it's easy to calculate. There's the core function, which, you know, easily computes the uh, Pearson's correlation coefficient between um, the data. You know, here's showing a strong negative correlation. Um, you know, as your car weight you know, increases, your miles per gallon will decrease. It's a very established correlation. And um, the plot function, which you know has all sorts of features, but you know giving it your x value and your y values easily will generate you know the scatter the scatter plot, which is very useful. And then let's say so you know that's obviously a, a simplistic version. You know a lot of you are probably dealing with data sets where you want to look at mass numbers of correlations that you know maybe even at one time. And um, so let's say you have this data set, and this is um, you know a common example used in statistics. Um, it's the iris data set, so it's. Uh, different flowers and you know their characteristics. So we have sepal length, sepal width, petal length, between the variables they all correlate you know differently in some ways. And so you know it's a really powerful visualization tool. When you're starting with a big state of data, you know, I always like to use the Paris function to try to get a feel for you know what is correlated with one another. You can see the big matrix and then you can see you know what are you going to investigate further. So it's a you know a good first step. Um, so another um, kind of correlation scatter plot thing is called the co-plot, and um, I believe this is an earthquake data set. And on the um, let's see if you're just looking at the first scatter plot, the latitude is on the y-axis, and then the longitude is on the x-axis. And um, and then, but let's say we want to look at those correlations, but we care about you know the depth of. Um, where you know the location was of the earthquake. Well, at the top, we're able to separate each scatter plot individually by the depth of um, you know where we are. You know, I think above sea level or, or so on. And um, so you're able to separate you know across that variable yet again. So it's another way to look at you know a subset of correlations that you want to look at. So you know overall, R is like as far as like data exploration and your initial steps for you know so looking for relationships in your data sets and so on and so forth. Um, the visual capabilities and the descriptive statistics are like extremely useful and a big pro of using the R. Okay, has um, as we have seen something about um, descriptive statistics, I'm I'm going to move to linear regression. So. First, why do we need linear regression? Um, these are the three main reasons uh, we do. Um, for example, for the first point, um, we can imagine that we want to predict a personalized medicine for genetic diseases, and we can put genetics um, from people as variables, then we can kind of predict 
um, what kind of medicine does the, the people need um, based on his own information. Or um, a more modern example would be um, for like websites like um, YouTube or uh, Amazon, they kind of display what you are interested in based on your history, browsing, um, um, your browsing histories, and then they put these kind of things into variables, then they build a model and to predict what you might like later on. And for the second point, um, we can, we know that a lot of um, variables that have correlation between each other and, but yeah, they have um, their own um, qualifications, so we kind of want to see what's, um, what are the unique um, influence that they have on the response variable, uh, and we can do linear regression models to get that information too. And so actually how we do um, linear regression, so we have response variable, um, y, which is continuous, and we have predictor variables, x1, x2. Um, they're called predictor variables, and we have the model there. Um, actually, in this process, what we're going to estimate is beta 0 to beta p, not x1 to xp, um, because x's are your data points, whether um, betas are the unknown parameters. And here, what I want to talk a little bit more is that the linear is about betas betas, not x's. So you, ha you can have models like um, log x times log x1 times beta 1, but you cannot have x1 times log of beta. And for the mechanism behind a linear regression is that we want to minimize the residual sum of squares, um, which we will see later on. So um, actually, if you're going to compute that with hand, it's going to involve a lot of calculation. But with R, you can simply um, write, type in a line of code, and R will do that automatically for you. And I'm going to talk a little about variable selection. Um, so we will not be able to. So say, say that you have a data set with like a thousand variables in that. You probably don't want to include all of them in your model. That's going to give you a very um, complicated one, and, and hard. It's very hard for you to interpret it later on. So we, if you want to do, um, we might want to make the model simpler. We want to find the most important variables that is related to your result, and then, um, and that's one of the main reason reasons that why we do um, variable selection. And uh, of course, it helps you eliminate of multicollinearity because a lot of variables have correlation between each other. Um, it also helps you save time and money. And how we actually do variable selection, there are two main respects. Um, one is called testing-based variable selection methods. Um, three main types are backward, forward, and stepwise. Um, so for backward, it's like you, have, you include all of your variables in the model at the first time, and then you start to eliminate the variables that are um, least, um, that are least significant in your model. For four, it's like the reversed um, procedure. So you have a like you have one variable in your model at the first, then you start to add the most significant variables into the model. And stepwise involves two of those procedures. And then there is a criterion-based procedure, um, which is there is four main types called AIC, BIC, adjusted R square, and Malo C. So what actually is a criterion? Um, since I'm going to fo um, focus mainly on AIC, so here I'll give one uh, equation about AIC. So it's basically just a number where you can compute based on all of the um, information that you have. So here, n is the n and p are the dimensions of your data set, where p is the number of variables and n is the number of your observations. And RSS is the um, residual sum of squares that I mentioned before, and R can calculate that for you too. So let's see some example. So for this example with US state fact and figures, um, people want to calculate the life expectancy based on all those seven uh, variables. It's population income, illiteracy, murder, murder rate, high school graduate, and um, frost in the area. So with R, if you want to get the linear regression model, you can simply type, type the model like that. Uh, LM is the function that you need for linear regression. 
and then you will just get all the coefficients that you want as the first column of the output. And then with all these results, you can have your linear model, like that. Sorry, the display is kind of weird, but... And then, here it comes your model, and then we're gonna do some variable selection to make the model simpler. R can, um, by the way, R can also give you an ANOVA table where you can easily see some residual sum of squares as here, 23.2971, which is the thing that you need to calculate for AIC. And for AIC, it's also a line of code with step G. So here's the output. You can see at very so at start we have the model um, with all the variables in it, and the AIC number is um, minus 22.18. And then for the output, we're gonna find um, a number, uh, the variable name that we can eliminate to make AIC smaller. So here we can see um, the AIC number that we will get after we eliminate area will be minus 24. Point a2, and then that this means that we're going to we're going to element area to make the model better, and we repeat the same procedure as we go on. We can eliminate um, illiteracy after we eliminate um, area, and it will keep it will make the AIC number even smaller, and we keep going until the last time uh, we can see there's no more. Um, variables that we can eliminate to make AIC smaller. And then here comes our final model with um, only population murder, high school graduate, um, and frost in our linear model. And finally, I'll give one graph about how we interpret the model. So um, 71.03 is called the intercept of the model. And for all four variables left, x1, which means population, x4, uh, murder rate, x5, high school graduate, and x6 as frost, which means the number of days that is below the freezing point. And then, so we start with 71.03, and one unit of x1 increase will make um, your life expectancy five times 10 to the minus five times larger, and one unit increase in X4 will make your life expectancy 0.3 smaller, and one point unit increase in X5 will make 0.05 um, life expectancy longer, and then X6, one unit increase in X6 will make um, 5.9 times 10 to the minus three um, times um, shorter. And that's basically how we, um, how linear model is going to give you. And if we um, 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 substitute the result that we have for Michigan, um, you can see we can have the predicted um, life expectancy. So for Michigan, we have 90, 91, uh, 91, 11,000 people, where we can substitute in X1 and 11.1 um, murder rate that we can substitute to X4. Um, 52.8 um, high school graduate, we can substitute to X5 and 125 days of temperature below freezing rate, substitute to X6, and that will give you the Y value that you are looking for. And this is all about linear regression. Hi, I'm Justin. I'm going to um, follow up with talking about and about uh, linear regression. Um, I'm going to talk about princi principal component analysis. So what is principal com component analysis? First, we, um, we talk about um, two general approaches of uh, reducing, vari reducing variables because you could, when, when you have a data set, you could easily have a, a lot of columns, a lot of um, features that, that you, might, you might or might not want to work with. And, and, and when, when the, col the number of columns are it is large, it's, it's really hard to, and, and sometimes um, it's really hard to deal with the, the data set. So you want to either um, select the feature, so uh, feature selection was what Nick was talking about, AIC, BIC, you would, you would want to get rid of the, the variables that are, that are less relevant, I guess, 
And um, here I'm, I'm going to talk about PCA, which is uh, a type of feature extraction. So you're going to preserve all of the effects of, of, of the columns that you have, but you're going to reduce that into a smaller, smaller dimension. So um, it's more, more it's, it's, it's more, the data set is more accessible, I guess. So we're going to create several artificial variables. Um, artificial in the sense that you're, you're going to weight the columns that you already have and then build, build uh, new dimensions. And um, conveniently, R, R has, I, the, the process is, is, I guess, a little bit tedious, but R has a built-in function conveniently that, that, can, that, can, um, that allows you to, to do principal component analysis really conveniently. So, so this is uh, an actual Pima data set. It, it, it's, it's, it's a data set. I'll, I'll go to the next slide to, to explain what the data set is. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's a data set about Pima Indians uh, living near Phoenix. It's female Pima Indians, and, and the data set was primarily aimed towards um, finding, finding some, kind of, some kind of relationship for, in, in a conclusion for, for the diabetes rate for, for female Pima, Pima Indians uh, in the region. And um, you would have, for now we have nine, date, nine columns to, to work with. We have pregnancy, we have glucose, um, and, and diastolic blood, blood pressure level, and so on and so forth, body mass index, and age, um, and going back to, to the actual data. So you would, you would see um, the dimensions are, it, it goes down to, to 500 lines, 500 rows of, of data, and then you have nine columns. And you can imagine a data set with a, with a much more bigger dimension for, for say, genetic data sets. You could have thousands of columns, and, and you, would, you, you wouldn't want to work with all of the columns. But, um, for example, I was, I, was, I was doing some independent research on, on stock yield data, and um, you, you would have maybe 500 columns. And, and it wouldn't make sense, sometimes it would make sense to, to get rid of some of the columns that are, that are less, um, that, that affect the column that you're, you're looking for. But, but in, in, in that case, it, when you're looking at yields, you, you don't want to, to get rid of certain columns. You would want to work with all of the columns, but, but make them into a combination that, that um, affects, I, I mean, um, that, that has more effect on the response variable that, that you're, you're working with. And um, imagine a linear regression. That, the, the, the biggest difference between linear regression and principal component analysis is that when you're doing linear regression, you have uh, you have a, a y that you want to to get a conclusion out of, and and then so that's that's the, the dependent variable, and then you would have independent variables, where that that are that who's that are the axes that that you were talk, was talking about, the the ones that you want to see the effect on on the y variable. And when you're doing principal component analysis, you're you're actually um, there there is no like dependent or independent variable. You're you're looking at the, the data set as a whole, and then you're looking at um, the effect of each variable, the correlation between the, the, the variables. So um, the next slide is the actual implementation. So a typical principal component, uh, principal component, sorry, uh, principal component would look like uh, this. So it would be one times insulin, and then it's 0 0.01 times glucose. You can, you can clearly see that insulin is a big part of the first principal component. And then going down to the second principal component, you would see glucose, weighted by one, and then age, diastolic blood pressure, and so on and so forth, weighted by a, a, a much smaller number. And uh, maybe the third also has um, diastolic blood pressure and the point three of tricep skin uh, skin thickness. Um, so so let's talk about what, what principal components are. It's, it's a little bit less important, I guess, what the principal components are, are composed of. It, and and it's, it's a little bit more important what, I mean, how many how many um, principal components you want to work with eventually, or or what what they look like in on on a on a um, graph, I guess. So I'll I'll just go into the next slide and show you what um, a data set might look like. So I, I I plotted I plotted the data points onto a two dimensional Euclidean space. I uh, I mean a two dimensional graph, and, and the x axis is the first principal component, and the the y axis is the second principal. So you saw that insulin was weighted as one, and then glucose was um, 0.01 or so for the, for the x direction. So you can see that the the first principal component um, has has a large large insulin. I mean, the in insulin is, is a big part of principal component. I mean, the, the the first principal component, and then if you look at the y-axis, glucose is the biggest factor here. And um, 
how many dimensions that do you want to look at? So how many principal components do you want to reduce your data into? Um, is, is, uh, it, it, it comes up in, in, in two slides, but you would, you would want to, to look at because the principal components are, are ordered in, in, in a way that, that captures the most variance in the first principal component and then it goes on and it, it decreases. And, and you would want to, you would, you would have to make a decision basically how many dimensions you want to look at. So looking at the R code, the R has a, a very com convenient function that it PR comp and, and other in other packages that, that do the same thing easily as well. Um, for 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 my data set, I, I just use PR comp and then I got rid of the categorical um, the categorical data and then I also got rid of diabetes, which which would be our our conclusion, I guess. So so it would be weird to 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 include that in the data. So I I am looking at seven dimensions and. Um, the cumulative proportions, so the one in the bold, bold letters, are, are the numbers that, that represent the, the, the variation that, that the, the principal components account for. for the, so the first principal component would account for 88.9% of the total variation in the data, and then the first and second would cumulatively account for 95% of the variation, and then the third would, would add maybe 2.6% to that, so that's 97.6%. So you would have to make a decision, I guess, how many principal components here you're working with based on uh, the, 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 the amount of variation that you want to account for. Uh, looking at the, the, the actual um, composite graphical, graphical function, so you would want to make a bar plot of, of the, the variations, I mean, just to, just to look at it more e easily than, than, than what you have up there. And then you would, have, you would also want to bi plot the one that I, I, was, um, I showed you here, would be the, the data points plotted onto the dimensions. And um, so I made a bar plot of, of the variations of, that each prin principal component would, would account for. The first one would have 85% and then the next one had, the, 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 the next one cumulatively had 95% and so on and so forth. You would want to make a decision there. And that's all I have for um, principal analysis. So that actually wraps this up. Thanks for uh, your students a chance to show off a little bit about what they know. Uh, if you guys have questions, you can catch me um, as we wrap up here. And uh, I mentioned earlier also the resources that CSCAR has for our and also for statistics more generally, so please make use of that. And I don't know, Emily, do you want to? Thank you all. Thank you all so much. And um, we'll, we'll hope to have some of the presentation materials up on our website soon um, so that y'all can access those. And we've recorded this so that we can have a video as well for you to view. And so we hope you re realize how powerful um, data and sharing data and access to data can be whenever you're working, especially with um, health populations and with medicine. So thank you for taking time. And we'll open up the floor to questions if you have any. On, on the matrix, uh, we, we had the names of the we had the names of the variables on the left and the principal components one through seven on the on the uh, on the horizontal. And I'm wondering, is there a when we say PC one, PC two, etc., is, is that a like a, a proxy uh, for the name of a principal component? Yeah. Well, so let me just say. So to be clear, the, the green crosses on this bar are the are the subjects in this data. So there's roughly 600 human beings in this data set, so every green cross corresponds to an actual living person. And then the, the axes of the plot, PC1 and PC2, are both summaries of the nine-dimensional collection of health attributes that the raw data consist of. So PC1 is some variable that primarily reflects insulin levels, but to some degree reflects other, other things. And the reason you know PC1 primarily reflects insulin levels is because the, the biggest arrow in the horizontal, running in the horizontal direction is the one labeled insulin. Yeah. PC2 primarily reflects glucose, but there are some other things that travel along with glucose that are in there as well. So basically someone who's, the person, the green dot that's right under the U, is someone whose insulin is, so the mean is basically at the, at the origin of the process. Right? So the person whose green dot is greater than you is someone who has extremely unusual, either on the high end or the low end, it could be flipped, you'd have to learn the to know. But unusual in one direction or the other, um, insulin values, but almost perfectly typical glucose. And then someone at the top would be someone who has very unusual glucose, but perfectly typical insulin, and someone who's out in the 45 state would be someone who's unusual in both, both dimensions. So it just gives you a picture of how 
how people, you know, individual differences is what, what this is all about. So people are different from each other. This is a risk group, so the female Indian population as a whole has very high risk for diabetes and other metabolic disorders, but they're, they vary from each other. And um, this is just a way of summarizing what the variation is, given that you couldn't easily just make a single plot that captured all nine variables. Uh, Justin mentioned that the broader context here is that these people eventually may actually reach the point where they have a diabetes diagnosis or even are on dialysis or ESRD. And uh, so you could overlay, say, who's on dialysis or who has diabetes, and then you might see that all the people with the actual disease status would cluster in some part of the spot, and that would help you trace the information in the covariance, the predictive variable, onto the outcome variable that um, you know, is in the background. So, um, from my understanding, do you, when you make these principal components, um, are you supposed to have some sort of like spanning set for all the data? Like you might, any data point as a new combination of different principal component things? Like, because you're supposed to represent all the same data in like the plus dimensions. So, how do you make sure you can represent all the data in these? Well, you're not in a, it's a data reduction technique. So you can't actually completely, you know, you can't go from nine dimensions to two dimensions without throwing something out. That's kind of a mathematical impossibility. So you are, you are throwing something out when you show this particular two-dimensional plot that you can never recover the full nine-dimensional data from this two-dimensional plot. The goal of principal component analysis is basically to say, of all possible two-dimensional plots that you can construct out of a nine-dimensional data set, which one captures the most information from the nine components that you're throwing the least out. And the theory says that this particular two-dimensional plot throws out the least information of any possible two-dimensional plot in that nine-dimensional original data. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah. So just take some like two-dimensional piece of the data that's playing in the nine-dimensional space. It's easiest to imagine if you started off with three dimensions and then yeah. you're just trying to project down to a two-dimensional plane. And you know some some of those two-dimensional planes will throw out more information than others depending on how you pick it. So the procedure picks the two-dimensional plane in three dimensions, or in this case in nine dimensions, that retains most of the original information. And that's what those percentages that Justin showed mean. This particular data set, and actually this tends to be the case in reality, most data sets actually are highly compressible because most most of the time when people collect a bunch of health variables, they're actually pretty strongly correlated. Risk factor, health risk factors just tend to be correlated. People who are unhealthy in one dimension tend to also be unhealthy in another dimension. Um, it turns out from here that um, you know even insulin alone, I think, captures like 96% of the variation. And then there's some additional glucose variation that's orthogonal or independent of that, which is captured in the second dimension. And anything beyond that is only going to add, like Justin said, a half a percent or one percent of the dimension. So this is a typical kind of data set that is uh, highly compressible, and that those percentages that come out of it analysis reflect that. Okay. Just in that data set, there seemed to be a lot of missing data points. Um, like there was a lot of zero values, um, like say triceps tri yeah. people. How did that influence the overall result? So principal, the default principal component analysis doesn't, I was wondering if that was shown. There you go. Yeah, so um, this may have been a bit of a, a bit of an oversight on our part, but um, default principal component analysis doesn't really know what to do with missing data. And um, there are more advanced versions of principal component analysis available in R, actually, that do, that do the right thing with missing data. So treat this as an illustration. This may actually not have done the right thing with missing data. Um, you know, one of the nice things about R is that, you know, like I mentioned earlier, it's the main tool used by research statisticians. So our, our top journals, the Journal of the American Statistical Association, the Annals of Applied Statistics, whenever someone writes a paper about a new way to do something, almost 98% of the time, they produce um, an R package that implements the procedure. And so missing data has been a major theme of statistical research for the last 15 years. And especially recently, there's been a lot of activity with missing data for principal component analysis and fancier ways of making principal component analysis, like sparse principal component analysis and different types of constraint principal component analysis. And all that stuff is available in R. It wouldn't be the PR COMP command that Justin showed. That's kind of the residual from the 70s S version of principal component analysis that probably doesn't have the missing data directly. But it's, 
possible. If we want to download our, um, should we go for a certain version of it? You know, because they, they call it our project when, I, when we browse for the, the our uh, concept. And, uh, and then it goes into different levels, 1.8 and, and 1.4 and things. Right. So is there a, a best one to go for? There's really just one um, primary release of R. And it's you know it, it's updated probably three or four times a year. Maybe this minor version increases even more often. But the major version of R goes up once or twice a year. And I would just pick the latest one. There are some um, branches of R which are either tailored to specific fields or are set up for people doing very specialized things like wanting to run like web applications on a server that's using R in the background. You know, so then they strip out a lot of the stuff that would slow it down and wouldn't be useful for that's a very specialized application. But 98% of the time, if you want to use R, just go to R project, get the, get the latest release. It's a big file because it's not just the R language, which in and of itself is not that big, but it's 3,500 or something like that packages that come, that come with it. So it's like a 60 megabyte download. But you know, download it, install it. All, I've done it zillions of times on all possible platforms, and it just installs it and click. There's no, never any issue with uh, you know, having to do anything fancy to get it to. Get it to Go. It's just there and run. It's very, it's very solid. Well, is the art project uh, comp, uh, is, is it all on all one package that when we download it, we don't have to go for our graph and our stat and our right. and our, uh, So a huge our number of packages are, are, have been deemed default packages that are included with the standard downloads. It has that kind of uh, what they say, you know, batteries included type of thing to it. Okay. But once you get out into the esoterica and people are just producing their own um, R packages, you know. That are maybe not refereed. And those are obviously not going to be in there. So there's another mechanism by which you can actually, just within R itself, you just type, you can just type library in the name of the library which you want, and then it knows where to go on the internet to, to download or to bring it in. But I guess as a cautionary note, once you get out to the stuff that hasn't been sort of deemed appropriate for including in base R, you're taking to some degree a risk that it may not be quite as solid as the stuff that's in the door. The court, there's a very nice review process, like I mentioned before, it's a very social sort of thing. So there's a lot, there's a very active user community. There's a lot of discussion and review and evaluation and testing that goes into deciding not just, um, well, statistically whether the things that are provided make sense, but also in terms of the software design and the implementation and the algorithms, whether it's reliable, it's not going to crash the computer, it's not going to happen, something like that. So people who use R a lot find it to be extremely solid as a piece of software. Um, that note, are there any, I've, I've seen um, papers even that compare R against uh, other packages uh, in terms of accuracy and whatnot, but are there any, have there any publications as to performance benchmarks or speed, how it compares with other languages? Yes, specifically the speed aspect of things. I, mean, I think where R really wins is the availability of the packages that cover such a huge range of I don't think anyone is going to um, stand up and say that R is the fastest tool around. Uh, people actually criticize it for being um, a little bit memory wasteful and not particularly fast. And people criticize the language for being sort of wonky in some ways. It's a little bit, of, it's because of its legacy going back to the 70s. It's built on a history of ideas, whereas something like Python or say that was developed later, you know, they were able to start from a blank, blank slate. So, um, and that's a very subjective thing, whether you like the design of the language or not, is, is a very subjective thing. Um, but I think, you know, in terms of the um, core matrix operations, and a lot of these statistical procedures really are just matrix operations, it uses the same underlying lay Fortran library that MATLAB and, and American Python and the other packages use. So there's really no reason why it should be any slower. But once you start doing things that involve the interpreter a lot, of course all, all interpreter languages are going to slow down a lot, but R is, I don't think it's known as being particularly efficient even compared to other interpretive languages. So it's probably not, the reality is it's probably not going to fare very well. So there's a trade-off there, but computers are so fast now. Um, most people will, will take the trade-off, ease of use, reliability, and the availability of a huge number of tools for you know, a 30 to 40% efficiency increase, especially if the analysis you're doing only takes five seconds in the first place. But it's a weakness of the, of the framework, I'd certainly accept that. Thanks, everyone.